right. I guess we're good. Cool. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name's Lisa, also known as Nifty Nye. Um, I've been working on Lightning for the past almost five years. Um, currently, I'm on leave from Blockstream to work on a book and writing some new classes for one of my projects called Base58. Um, which is a Bitcoin protocol school. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about layer twos, specifically um, around kind of my definition of what a layer two is and um, kind of how I think about layer two design. So this talk is called Layer Two Design Decision. Um, I'm also going to be writing out my talk as I go. So can everyone read that? Is that good? Okay, cool. All right, cool. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I have about half an hour and we'll see how much I get through this. Okay, so when you're talking about layer twos, I think it's kind of useful to have a good definition of what a layer one is. So kind of start with like, okay, like what is a layer one? Um, and my way, I think there's a lot of ways you can kind of define a layer one, but um, the way that I like to kind of start with how to think about a layer one is you start about thinking about layer one as an accounting system. Um, so for Bitcoin, for example, so most of the examples I'm going to give in my talk today deal with the Bitcoin ecosystem, so to speak. Um, what does it mean for the layer one to be an accounting system? Um, I think like the basic idea, right, is that you um, you have, like, so what is an accounting system then really? Um, the idea is that an accounting system, you have, you want to keep track of users and a balance, right? Um, so the way that this works on Bitcoin, Bitcoin uses blocks and transactions that go inside of blocks um, as the way to keep track of who owns what Bitcoin as, like, an entire system. And, um, What's the other? There's one other important thing, right? And so then when you have a transaction um, on Bitcoin or on layer one, or any layer really, a transaction on any layer, um, really what a transaction is then is a state update, right? And it expresses a change from the current state, which is who owns what Bitcoin, to a new state, which is still who owns what Bitcoin, but different. Um, so who owns what Bitcoin? but different, okay. Um, and the mechanism, again, so like the mechanism for layer one is you have a block, um, you put transactions in the block, um, and then there's some limitations on this accounting system, so to speak. Um, a block is like a batch of transactions, so it's sort of like doing batch processing on state updates for an accounting system, right? Okay, cool. So layer one is an accounting system. Okay, so what is a layer two then? Um, a layer two is, get this guys, a layer two is also an accounting system. Um, so it's just a different, usually it's a different accounting system, though there's a few exceptions that we'll get into, um, than the layer one. Um, a crucial point about the layer two accounting system is that we're still accounting for the same like object that the layer one accounting system does. So it's the same object or thing as the layer one. The only difference is that we're now kind of using different, like in some cases, I would say like different primitives, so to speak, um, in the accounting system. Okay, that's all sort of like well and good, whatever. And this allows you, so this, having the separate uh, primitives and a different accounting system, which is separate and distinct to some extent, hand wave from the layer one, um, gives you the opportunity to transact in the layer one instrument, um, but doing it in a, um, in a ledger that is not the layer one ledger. And so the idea with this is that because you're using allows transacting of the layer one primitive in a different accounting system, right? Okay, so that's kind of like my headline illustration of, um, so basically like, you keep track of ownership in a different ledger than the layer one ledger. Okay, so that's kind of my like high level of like assertion of what a layer two is. Um, let's look at some examples. Maybe this will be a little bit more concrete um, when we have some examples. So here are some examples of layer twos. Um, we all know and love lightning. Um, something called fediments, 
which are like eCash, token, mints. Um, uh, there's also the liquid sidechain is another Bitcoin one. Um, and then there's some, so these are all things that are like shipped or in the process of being shipped. So these are things you can kind of use today. There's also some proposed layer two things such as I've heard of state chains. So I feel like someone could point out that maybe some of these already have been implemented. So that would, all right, whatever. I'm not totally up to date on it. Um, and then there's like validity rollups, different rollup flavors that are being talked about. Over on ETH, ETH also has layer twos. Um, I think most of the ETH ones that have been launched that I'm aware of are rollups. Um, so some examples of the ETH rollups would be like um, specific examples or like Optimism is one, Arbitrum is another competing one, and then there's stuff like Aztec, which is like a zero knowledge proof rollup system. Okay, lets you transact with stuff in batches. Okay, so there's some examples of layer twos. Um, okay, and so then just really quickly like okay, so what are my initial proposal or initial like assertion was that layer twos deal with accounting systems, right? So what are the accounting systems of all these examples? So what accounting systems do these guys use? Uh, let's go through it. Lightning uses cached layer one transactions. Uh, Fediments use something called Chalmian tokens. Chow. Chalmian tokens. So this is also known as like eCash. Um, Liquid is a side chain, uses a whole second uh, blockchain. Um, what else did I put up there? I had proposed that validity rollups um, are kind of weird. They actually use uh, the layer one stuff, question mark. So you're like, I don't know. That one's like questions with Nifty's definition of, of accounting system stuff, but it uses layer one, sort of. Um, uh, what other stuff did I have? Uh, state chains and space chains, I think, it's been a while since I've looked at these proposals, but I think these are similar to Lightning. I think they kind of use cash layer one transactions as well, to some extent. Um, and then on ETH, I don't know, the roll-up stuff, they have like, kind of like, they kind of have like a whole second blockchain as well. So I'm sure someone could like argue with me about that one. Um, cool, okay. So that's like, okay, so these are the accounting system that these other guys use. Um, in some cases, we've got like a whole second system that we're looking at. In other cases, we're kind of just using what I would call primitives from the layer one, um, but sort of in a non unconventional way than you normally use when you're transacting on layer one. Um, okay, so when I give this like example out here, like most people are like, okay, Lisa, that's all well and good. I usually get some wise guy who shows up and is like, hey, what about Coinbase? Isn't that, isn't that a layer two? Um, and you say, okay, um, well, let's look at the case of Coinbase, like, why might someone assert that Coinbase is also a layer two? Um, so how does Coinbase work? Um, in Coinbase, let's say you wanna deposit some Bitcoin, so on layer one, right? So you would make a, well, first you'd make an account, make an account at Coinbase, and then you would, Coinbase would give you an on-chain address, right? So you'd make a layer one transaction um, into the Coinbase wallet, right? And then Coinbase, in exchange for this Bitcoin that you've given them, would issue you in their accounting system a new record that has like your account name in it, so it issues you an account and a new balance, right? Okay, so then if you wanted to transact with another Coinbase user um, who also had an account with them, you would tell Coinbase, and so Coinbase would update their database, um, which is a separate ledger, so that's a secondary accounting system, and then your money would move from your account to the other user account at Coinbase, so you're transacting on a different accounting system using the same layer one primitive. Um, so this would be, based on like my definition so far of what a layer two is, this would seem to pass the layer two designation, right? 
Um, I'm gonna say that that's like, uh, I would say that that's like a little unsatisfactory. Um, um, how many of you agree that that's a little unsatisfactory that we can call Coinbase also a layer two? Okay, we got some hands about, we got about 50-50, okay. Um, okay, so 50-50 unsatisfactory. Um, some people, I guess, are just easily satisfied. I don't know. All right, I, I'm not that easily satisfied. I, I think that's unsatisfactory. So let's add, I think, I think there's one more thing here that we need to add to our um, understanding of what a layer two is. And I would say that in layer two systems, at least the ones that I've outlined previously in my example list, um, I think there's one other crucial aspect to um, transacting on those layer twos, and that's that authorization to move the instruments or to update, to move the funds, or to, in other words, like to, I don't know, effectuate state transitions on the layer two accounting system, right? Okay, that's a fancy way of saying. Um, basically, that's a fancy way of saying uh, transact, right? Transact on that layer two. Um, that the authorization to move the funds needs to sit only with the asset holder. So what does that mean? It means that you basically need some sort of signature uh, that only the person who holds the asset um, can authorize movements, movements or AKA transactions of those instruments, right? Um, so this, addition to my original definition would effectively rule out Coinbase, right? Because Coinbase can move the asset without the user's explicit, in this, most cases, I think we use cryptographic signatures as authorization to move the assets. Um, and I think that that holds for pretty much all of the previous examples. Like you need a signature of some sort in order to authorize a transaction to go through. And there's a way to validate that that authorization is permissible whenever you're looking at or your partner is looking at whoever who sees this transaction um, uses some amount of signatures to validate that the state update is valid. Okay, cool. Um, great, okay, so I think that kind of, I think that kind of like does my whole like what is the definition of a layer two. Um, uh, Okay, so I think like maybe one thing that's kind of more interesting to get into now is let's look a little bit more at this relationship between the layer one ledger and the layer two ledger. So um, once you have this like, okay, so let's look at, look at the relationship between a layer two and a layer one. Um, uh, sorry, I'm like having a... Okay, so specifically, like, we said that layer one is an accounting system, and layer two is also an accounting system, but that uses, um, basically, you can make transactions um, using, basically, the denomination of what the layer one asset is, but in a separate layer. Okay, so basically, like, how, how do you get this authorization, or how do you get this ability to move some of these transactions into a different ledger, right? Like kind of what's a relationship there between the asset in layer one and the asset in layer two? It's not like I can just go out and like create a new ledger and say this is a Bitcoin ledger and start handing out like, I don't know, um, assets that I claim are Bitcoin on it. Say no, no, promise this is like a second accounting layer and you have to have a signature to validate it, et cetera, et cetera. It needs to have some connection to the underlying like asset, right? Like you need a like a connection. I think traditional parlance of like layer two design, they tend to call them bridges. I think is sort of what you might have heard, but you kind of need some way of taking. So what this kind of looks like is you need a way to um, I'm going to say sequester um, funds on layer two and on layer one, excuse me, in such a way like that. So they're basically like earmarked um, so that the accounting for the ownership of that asset, ownership of that asset can occur elsewhere. Um, so the way that we see this happen, the technology most frequently used on Bitcoin in order to sequester funds kind of 
you lock them up in a lockbox in, in one way. So we kind of lock up funds on layer one, and that permits us to use a separate accounting system. Um, the fancy way that we do this is we use multi-sigs, tends to be like the uh, multi-sig accounts sort of. So shared multi-sig or shared accounts um, where you sort of freeze the assets on layer one, um, and that sort of transfers the um, ability to do accounting or ownership of that asset into a different system. Okay, so how does that work exactly? Like, okay, so a good example of this, I think, is Liquid. So Liquid sidechain is probably like early, this is like an easy example to link at. Um, how many of you know about liquid sidechain, have heard of it? Okay, so like most people. Okay, I'll give a really quick example. So the way that liquid works is that you get a on-chain address from a federation, and then you send your Bitcoin to that address. And once it's on that address, you can then do something where you ask the federation to issue you an equivalent, equivalent, amount of Bitcoin instrument on the side chain, so in a second blockchain, which they call liquid Bitcoin. Um, so basically, um, they issue you equivalent tokens to what you locked into the multi-sig address that they gave you on layer one um, on the side chain. So they call this pegging in, it's called a peg in. Um, so basically, you then have a balance of Bitcoin that equals what you issue, what you locked up on layer one. And then you can transact with it on the second side chain. Um, when you want to go back, you basically request to get your funds back on the main chain. And then basically that's like a peg out. So you can go both ways, kind of using their multi-sig as the bridge between these two accounting systems, which are both, they're both blockchains. Um, another example, also a federation. So it kind of works the same way. The only thing that's different is the asset that you get issued. Is not a block is not tokens on a blockchain, um, but it's eCash tokens is in federated mints, um, also called Fedimint is kind of the specific implementation that some people I know are working on, um, and so this works very similarly. I think I haven't looked at their specs in a while, um, but I think the general idea is you would send on chain or layer one funds to a multi sig, and then in exchange instead of getting additional tokens on a separate blockchain, you would get issued eCash tokens um, into an eCash wallet that you could then use and spend, same as Bitcoin, the underlying asset that you had locked in. And then when you want to leave, you would send your eCash tokens to the Mint along with an on-chain address, and they would send Bitcoin back out to you. So you'd basically exit the layer two. Okay, um, cool. I think that's like, I think that's a pretty good understanding of sort of the layer two design space. Um, okay, so now that we sort of understand layer twos with my last 15 minutes, um, let's talk about like why are layer twos? Okay, so why would we do this? Like why do we need a second accounting layer? Like what was wrong with the first accounting layer, right? Like why are we doing all this? Like why? Why send your money into like a multi-sig and lock it up on layer one so you can transact with it elsewhere? Why not just transact with it on layer one? Um, I think the long short of it is that um, uh, the problem with everyone trying to transact on layer one is that there's a limited number, limited amount of block space, particularly on Bitcoin. Um, and so the problem with having a limited amount of block space is that uh, the number of transactors that you can get on Bitcoin at any one time um, is like is limited to the block size, right? So basically, um, it sort of becomes like a scaling issue, right? The other issue that comes up with Bitcoin is the transaction trail. So when you transact on Bitcoin, you then create a record or a public global ledger of movements of coins that live forever and are forever inspectable by anyone. So by transacting on the ledger that is Bitcoin, you then get, um, a, you just have a historical record. Whereas if you move your coins into a layer two, 
with a different accounting system. Um, these different accounting systems introduce um, different privacy primitives, I would say, than you get on layer one. Um, a good example of that is like, uh, so like privacy, I would say privacy. Um, the eCash tokens, for example, I think are a pretty good example of having pretty good privacy. Um, there's some trade-offs there, which I'm not gonna talk about, but um, you get decent privacy with eCash tokens as opposed to, in terms of the trail of transactions that exist in our public. Um, Lightning also, I think, has pretty good properties in this way in terms of the historical record of um, state updates, aka transactions on Lightning is quite um, uh, compressed or like, mm, there's not a lot of people that hear about those. Okay, um, so I think those are like my motivation for this. Right, um, okay, so the po point of layer twos is that we can like, I think the point about layer twos that I wanna make is that um, you're basically distributing the surface area, oh gosh, that's hard to read, surface area of transacting ledgers, like ledgers that you can transact across um, into a bunch of different systems. So the total number of people that can be effectively making state updates or transactions using the primitive, the layer one primitive, which is Bitcoin, um, grows kind of like a lot larger, like I would say exponentially, but I don't even think there's like a relationship and function step size in terms of transaction throughput, um, just by having all these different ledgers available. Um, so the cool thing then is you can transact with Bitcoin um, without having to worry about the same like scaling issues that you might if it was just on a single layer, like the single layer of Bitcoin, the single ledger, I should say. Okay, just reading the area of transactability, sure. Okay, so that's kind of cool. I feel like there's one other point here that I wanted to make that I'm forgetting. Should we do the load? Um, oh, right, and then it kind of like, you kind of get a different cost structure of a transaction. So the cost to make a transaction um, is now varied across these different systems. Um, different accounting ledgers have different costs associated with making those transactions, but now you kind of have some variety there, which is cool. Still missing one other point, but that's fine. Okay, um, cool. Okay, so I think for my last like point that I wanted to make, so far we've talked about like what is a layer two and we've given a definition for it. Um, we've kind of talked about why would you want a layer two. So this last section in my last like 10 minutes, um, I kind of thought it'd be interesting to go through some different aspects of layer twos or different features that you can think about when comparing layer twos um, as different things that kind of differentiate the strengths versus weaknesses of a system. Um, so I came up with, I don't know, okay. Um, kind of came up with like, I think I have six different aspects of a layer two, which are fun to think about. Um, so layer two features. Um, the first one would be uh, something that I'm calling the broadcast scope of state changes. Um, so this is kind of like how many people find out about my transaction. Um, uh, something about like a liveness requirement to effectuate a transaction. Um, this means how many people or actors in this case uh, need to participate to make my transaction valid or like actually have agreed to have occurred. Um, uh, the cost of the transaction, so what is the, like the, what is the value I have to lose, so to speak, to make the state update happen. Um, the granularity of a transaction, clarity, that's not how you spell granularity. That is, okay of a transaction, which is um, what's like the minimum minimum viable transaction size, how much value can I move basically on the system? Like what's the minimum value that I can move on the system and have that be a valid transaction? Um, uh, ruggability of the system. Um, so like how screwed am I? As you, like, I guess how much, how much trust am I putting in the system with my, with my coins? 
Um, and then the last one is I'm calling it exitability, which is like kind of tightly related to ruggability, but not exactly. And that's like, who do I have to talk to to exit that layer? That layer. Um, cool. Great. To, specifically, back to layer one when I'm thinking about this, because it's possible for layer twos to interoperate. You can have, because these are different accounting ledgers, right? Like layer twos are just accounting systems. It's possible to have interfaces where you exchange value of one accounting system for another. A good example of this is so the Fedder, the Fediment, um, which is an eCash token project, has built out something that they're calling Lightning Gateways. So this is someone who's operating a Lightning node would be able to accept eCash tokens and pay a Lightning invoice on their behalf. So this basically, these gateways are ways of transferring. Bitcoin value across two different ledger systems, so to speak. One that's an eCash token and one that's like channel state, channels, yeah, channel stuff. Okay, um, so just really quickly, how do these how do these work across the different things? So I guess we could do like um, I only have I have time. Okay, so like okay, if we just start with like broadcast scope, um, let's look at each of these in turn across our like four or five different examples of layer two, right? So with Lightning, what is the broadcast scope? So how many people, let me, hang on, let me bring this up over here so I can, um, oh no, um, let's see, so we can see them at the same time. Okay, so here's my features and then we can walk through them over here. Um, okay, so broadcast scope, as a reminder, is how many people find out about my transaction. Um, in Lightning, does anyone know the answer to this? How many people find out about a transaction when a transaction happens? There's a minimum and a maximum number. What's the minimum number of people that might be able, that would have to know about a transaction in Lightning? Two, two right? And why is it, why is it two? Send over right. Only, okay, so it's a, yeah. So the minimum is the, the minimum is two because that's the number of parties in a channel. Um, there's a maximum, though, of people that might need to find out about this. Does anyone know? Where's my lightning folks at? Oh, wow, you can really hear me now. I think it's 21, right? Because you can do 20 hops, which means there's 21 parties. So the maximum number of hops you can make is 20, which means that there's at max 21 parties. My math might be wrong here, but I think it's right. Right. <laughs> one, one, yeah, one, yeah, 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 okay, okay, min max, 21 parties, so it, it most the broadcast scope is the number of people that touch the transaction, which in Lisa's case of a single shot payment would be 21 at max, according to the, um, and this is in spec at max, you can have 20 hops in a single onion, okay, um, what other things did I have, I had lightning, I had, what was the other one, fediments, I think, um, so in a fediment, whenever you make a transaction, I think it's you, um, the person you're making the exchange with, and then the mint also finds out about it. So you would also tell the mint that you're exchanging um, some tokens. Um, the, so in liquid, it's gonna be basically the same as like layer one. Oh, I probably should have put layer one in here. Let's just do like Bitcoin, because that's kind of fun. Bitcoin, um, this is like global, right? Uh, but it's global in like kind of like the lazy state, right? People can catch up with it eventually. It's like lazy global. But eventually, everyone in the network is going to find out about your transaction in layer one, right? So everyone in the network is going to find out about it. Cool. Liquid is the same. It's global in the same way because it's also a blockchain. Um, so you don't really gain anything in broadcast scope there. Um, I feel like there was another example, but I don't remember it. It's fine. It's like validity rollups, which like per my understanding, is the same. They're also global because they like ride on the layer one, so you still, everyone would find out about the updates. Um, the ETH layer two stuff, when you start doing like ETH rollups, like optimistic rollups, I guess is what you call it. I don't know, I'm like, words are hard. Um, the way that these things work is that, my understanding is that it's this kind of similar, it's like global in the state of the rollup, so it's like kind of like liquid, so like liquid sort of, sort of like liquid. Basically the same thing. Basically the same thing. Basically side chains, sort of. I'm sure some, yeah, yeah, okay. Slightly different, but sort of, okay. Um, 
Uh, and I think, okay, I think that's all my examples. All right, let's keep going, because I've got like five minutes and I've got like five more things to do. Um, ah, okay, what else have we got? Liveness requirements. Okay, this means like who actually needs to like participate in my transaction in order for it to be effectively aided, right? Previous one is who finds out about my transaction. This is like who has to participate in my transaction. On layer one, so like Bitcoin layer one, um, it's basically like the miners, right? You need a miner to be participating in the block creation in order to make it work. On Lightning, uh, does anyone know the answer to this one? Yeah, so it's the same as the broadcast scope, right? So the liveness requirement of Lightning is same as broadcast scope. So min2 max21 hashtag not split payments. Um, okay, uh, what else do we have? We have Fediments. Um, this is also the same as broadcast scope, right? Um, no, actually, that's not true. Um, it's just going to be the mint. The mint's the only one that needs to make action to effectuate the change. Like, you're, I don't, mm, I think, does the receiver have to produce a signature to get a new token issued to them? Well, they have to be online in order to, like, receive your... Okay, this <laughs> one needs more research, needs research. All right, but I think it's somewhere between you, same as broadcast scope to just the mint, depending on how it's implemented. Yeah. It's, the mint definitely is going to be involved, I think, in the exchange. Yeah, the, right. So if the recipient doesn't want to be double spent, they have to cash their cash token in, like, immediately. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think in the Fediment thing, they require you to cash it in with the mint. So oh, hand wave, okay. Hand wave, up to three. Um, depends on implementation. What else did I have up here? I had a few other things. Sorry, I'm like, my brain is liquid. Um, liquid is same as layer one, right? The miners, which are really federa federation members, like signatories to the signet sort of. Um, what else is there? Validity rollups. I think that's going to be the same as the miners. Um, because it rides on layer one. Uh, and then ETH roll up is, uh, this depends on the sequencer, I think is what they call them, but basically it's like kind of similar to like the federation, except if I understand there's like only one party that you're, has to be online, like the block builder. Um, so you're just kind of like, there's this like a single party that has to be up and running in order. Which one? Yeah, the Lady rollups and optimistic rollups basically have the same life as your partners. You need to have the sequencer that's online and they then post the state update to a contract on layer one. So layer one also has to be live. Yeah. So yeah. Like the sequencer and then layer one miners. Mm -hmm. So this is the same. Yeah. Same. Okay. okay. Same, same. Cool. Okay, let's keep going. I have like Two minutes. I'm not going to make it. It's fine. Um, okay. Uh, cost of a transaction. Uh, layer one, it's whatever the minor fee is. It's kind of determined by the current demand function for block space, right? Most people are familiar with this. I don't think I have to go into that. Uh, anything that also uses layer one is going to have the same thing. So I think roll ups are like kind of hand wavy, hand wavy, a function, a fractional function of what the current block space market is, I think is a good way of saying that. Um, Lightning is going to be by volume of sats moved. Ecash, I don't know, is it free? Maybe it's free. I don't know how much they charge you to get your tokens exchanged at the mint. I think it's free though, which is kind of cool, I think. I think like the Fediment thing is free, question mark? I don't know, yeah. Free, maybe, they're still figuring it out. Um, but it could be free, which is exciting. Liquid is basically the same in terms of like a block space fee. It's block space demand function fee. Um, I'm just gonna keep going, I'm like really out of time. Should I, I can stop, I can keep going. I'll like quickly run through these maybe, I'll go over like two minutes, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, granularity. Granularity, granularity of a transaction is the minimum viable transaction size on layer one. It's the dust limit currently. Hand wave, which I believe is like 150 sats-ish. 
Um, anything that operates on layer one, so like, I actually don't know, okay. Um, li lightning, it goes down to one one thousandth of a sat. Oh, that's my thing. Um, uh, ecash, ecash is kind of weird, not like actually weird, but it's kind of weird. And the reason that ecash is weird is that they issue tokens and denominations, at least the implementation of Betterment does. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna off really fast. Um, stop. Um, okay, I'm getting kicked off. Cool, great. This has been super fun. Um, there's two other things that we can go through later, but I'm gonna post this to the internet. Um, and if you want to know more about me or what I do, um, I'm on Twitter at Nifty9. I teach the Bitcoin protocol at Base58, which you can find on the internet. We're doing a Taproot class in Prague and Lightning July in Nashville. And hope to see you guys again. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.